Hyper Wellbeing, a podcast about the startups, technologies, and people driving a brand new healthcare industry. Healthcare for healthy people. Consumer and data driven, emerging as devices, apps, mobile, biology, health, and wellness converge. Continuous prediction, prevention, and optimization paradigm. And now, over to your host, D.S. Dreibra. Hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of the Hyper Wellbeing Podcast. On today's show, we have Nathan Price. Dr. Nathan Price is Professor and Associate Director of the Institute for Systems Biology, where he co-directs with Lee Hood, the Hood Price Integrated Lab for Systems Biomedicine. He is co-founder and on the board of directors of Arivale, GeekWire's 2016 Startup of the Year. He received early career awards from the NIH, NSF, American Cancer Society, the Roy J. Carver Charitable Trust, and Genome Technology. He was Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar and received the 2016 Grade A Goldsmith Award. He serves on numerous advisory boards, including for Roche, Personalized Medicine Division, Providence St. Joseph Health, Serra Prognostics, Habit, and the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Biosustainability. He is Fellow of the European Society for Preventive Medicine and serves on the Board of Trustees for the Health and Environmental Sciences Institute. Hello, Nathan, and welcome to the seventh episode of the Hyper Wellbeing Podcast. Hi, Lee. It's great to be with you. Appreciated. The last time I saw you was at Hyper Wellbeing 2016, where you gave a keynote. That was greatly appreciated. It was a great meeting. Thanks for organizing. Um, so, Nathan, can you do a favor and jump in and just provide a quick synopsis of what systems biology is? Sure. Um, so, systems biology is essentially an approach that attend, uh, attempts to be holistic and quantitative. So it's holistic in the sense that you're trying to understand the integration of multiple biological components and how they work together as a system uh, to create phenotypes. So it's a build on essentially to molecular biology that was mostly about trying to understand what individual parts do. And then the quantitative aspect is you're, is you're trying to understand that whole system from making quantitative measurements. This is omics data and things like that. And then quantitative computational modeling to try to then put it all back together. So that's essentially systems biology. So putting it back together, can you explain that computational part? I just want to make sure that everyone can get that. Sure. Well, let's, we'll, we'll take a, uh, a simple example. So let's take the process of metabolism in the body. Maybe not so simple. <laughs> uh, but if you look yeah, at that... Metabolism it's like a, a simple part in the body, Nathan, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, the simple exactly. part. <laughs> Yeah, I did my whole PhD studying a teeny corner of it, so it's it's plenty it's plenty complicated. Yeah, some of the some of the systems biology charts for metabolism are just absolutely ridiculous to look at. They're like four hundred pieces, and not just the high level simplified version. Yes, yes, exactly. So, but in essence, so if you're doing molecular biology, you're figuring out what does an enzyme do, right? And so, if you figure out that this um, enzyme. Uh, you know, it takes a glucose molecule and phosphorylates it or, or whatever it is that, you know, any particular enzyme does. A systems biology approach, then putting it all together is essentially building those big complex maps that you've seen, right? So that you start saying, all right, we figured out through molecular biology what all, and biochemistry what each of these enzymes does. In systems biology, you're putting that all together, creating a map, and then you're building computational simulations of metabolism. So you ask questions like, you know, for this network, uh, given what it's eating, you know, how much ATP can it make? Um, does it have all the components necessary to make the amino acids? Uh, which, you know, uh, does it have the ability, uh, how much redox um, uh, potential, you know, is uh, how much uh, redox flux can you uh, deal with in this network and so forth. And so essentially in systems biology, you're trying to answer a question uh, about um, how all those pieces interact as a whole. And then in systems biology, maybe you're modeling a metabolic network. And then you ask another question, which is how is that metabolic network regulated? And so then you build a model of gene regulation that interfaces with that metabolic model and so forth. And so that's one of the things that you do in systems biology is just to try to ask that question of how do all these pieces interact how do they work together? And then how do they predict uh, a phenotype or a trait that you, you care about? 
Hey, Nathan, that's super interesting. And when you were describing it there, I was like, hey, that's what I would have studied if I could go back in time and begin all over again. I mean, I'm, I'm envious that, that that's what you have been doing. That just sounds absolutely fascinating. It's really a fascinating area. Uh, I really love working in systems biology. Yeah, it seems more like it seems more of an engineering computer science discipline it's, than what I would have normally associated with biology from my school days. Yeah, and there's certainly an element of that. Uh, so my training actually is in engineering. My PhD is in bioengineering um, from uh, UCSD, where I worked with Bernard Paulson, himself also an engineer. So there are different flavors of systems biology, certainly. And my path in did come more from the engineering side. Uh, so we do you know, think about how to take a system, uh, take it apart, try to understand how the components interact together, you know, get blueprint diagrams for how that system operates. It's just like fixing a car. <laughs> a it's little just bit. It's like the a blueprint like you get for the car and the wiring diagrams you get for cars. Yeah, and there's some interesting uh, comparisons back to that. Of course, there's also significant differences because you're dealing with an evolved system and you don't, the rules behind it are, are sometimes opaque, but, <laughs> but it just it becomes just a tougher system. That you complexity, like. Complexity, I think. Complexity is is fascinating. I don't like to end at complexity. I think you know you you try to deal with complexity, and then at the other side, you, you try to get right. You try to get to the level of insight or, or you know or simplicity and so forth. I think a lot of science, of course, is about trying to you know take these you know complex observations that we see around us and trying to you know see you know beyond the details. Try to see something that is. Um, where we can make a simplification, where we where we learn something uh, deep about a system, and so you know, I think that's what we're always striving for. So at a first pass, yeah, you just sort of embrace the complexity, and then you hope to be able to pull things out that are actionable. Actionable simplicity, I like to call it. So you go from complexity to actionable simplicity. Uh, try to find insights out of those data. Well, appreciated for that. It reminds me a little bit of good artists who say at the beginning, everything gets expands and gets messier. But then as you get insight and develop your skills, you begin to simplify. And sometimes the most simple thing was derived from the greatest complexity. You mentioned the word redox. W would you be so kind as to just briefly introduce redox? Redox is um, basically just uh, reduction in oxidation. So the reduction in oxidation states in, uh, in metabolites is one of the dominant um, transformations that has to be undertaken by uh, metabolism. Uh, and so uh, that's what I was referring to. So this is the, the, the point of things like um, NADH and NADPH and, and things like this, which are really redox uh, potential carriers uh, in, your, in your cells. You introduced in one of your papers, I think you did, or someone at um, ISB, or the term uh, personal dense dynamic data clouds. C can you introduce the term personal dense sure. dynamic data clouds, please? Yeah, so this is a term um, that Lee Hood and I introduced in our uh, Nature Biotechnology paper uh, from last year. Uh, but basically the notion is to generate data that's personal, so it's specific to every individual. Dense, meaning we make lots of measurements. Dynamic, those measurements are over time. And so the notion between having personal dense dynamic data clouds is that in essence, what it's going to give us is a broad view of what's happening in a person's body over time uh, so that we can uh, derive two things from it. Uh, so one is to quantify wellness so that we can quantify health state. It doesn't have to be well, but anyway, the person where they're, where they're at uh, but you quantify that state. And then second is to look for, over time, the transitions. So one of our big dreams is to try to understand the early warning signs for all the major human diseases so we can figure out ways to predict them and prevent them. And we believe that's only possible really by generating these personal dense dynamic data clouds. So that's, that's a big goal of ours. And so what constitutes... Uh, a data cloud, what type of data? It can vary, uh, you know, as long as it's dense and dynamic. For us, what's typically in uh, what we've done so far is you have your genome uh, as a baseline, and then we have multiple time points where we measure proteomes, metabolomes, 
uh, clinical labs, wearable devices, uh, data, um, uh, microbiomes, um, those kind of data. Uh, and so you could expand that as well with uh, immunosequencing, with epigenetics, uh, but essentially you're trying to get a large amount of integrated data uh, coupled with uh, kind of knowledge of uh, what's happening to a person in their health state, their clinical uh, data, and so forth. Okay, so the these, uh, it's, it's quite a mouthful, personal dance dynamic <laughs> data clouds. It is. Dense phenotyping is uh, the simpler version we're kind of moving to, as I think some of the field is as well. What are you calling it, the or short version? Uh, deep phenotyping. Uh-huh. Deep phenotyping. Deep, deep phenotyping. So these, this deep phenotyping, it will be used for two, two, two categories. The first is uh, quantifying wellness, and the second is demystifying uh, disease. Yeah, so the quantification of wellness we're very uh, interested in. Uh, and in fact, there was a, a quote I really liked. So I was on a panel uh, a few years ago with uh, Denny, uh, Denny Asiello, who is uh, actually the uh, chief of medicine for uh, Mass uh, General at Harvard Medical School. And he said something that really stuck with me. Uh, and he said, healthcare is the only industry that doesn't study its own gold standard, which is wellness. And I, I you know, and I really, uh, I really resonated with that. It was, you know, of course, right on point with, you know, what, what we're talking about. Um, but I love to hear it from someone who is in, you know, the position that, that he is in and with the, you know, gravitas that he has in the medical field, because it's really true. And so, you know, we don't, as a community, there's huge amount of research dollars that are spent on disease. That makes you know, a lot of sense to that, but we don't have much at all that has gone into the quantified, quantified scientific study of wellness, the gold standard of, of the body and how it works. And so that's really what we're pushing on that front. So we want to quantify wellness. We want to understand that state. And the reason we really want to understand it deeply molecularly is because we want to be able to see and understand when the system starts to depart from a wellness state for each individual. And then that leads to the second big point, you know, this demystifying disease, which is really about identifying that early uh, disease transition. Because what we believe, in, and actually in some diseases, it's just, it's play, it's just clearly true, and we can start talking about that, which is that early stage disease can be quite easy to treat and reverse, and late stage can be nearly impossible uh, or you know, we can't do it today. And so the desire to understand that wellness state, understand the early transitions and be able to stop disease before it really starts is central to what we're really interested in, in developing. Um, I'm smiling here because I would love it if we had like four hours together. And uh, I'd love to spend an afternoon with you and pick your brains over so many things. So just you one of these days we'll get together. <laughs> yeah, it's just pulling pulling me in. I'd really love some of uh, a significant amount of your time at some point in the future. I'll I'll, I'll plot in evil ways how I might be able to uh, achieve that. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, so anyway, if we look at healthcare, you know, uh, orthodox healthcare, at my event. Uh, in 2016, you 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 said, uh, and I think you were quoting the uh, New England Journal of Medicine in, in your assertion. And if I quote you, you said, you can attribute about 30% of a person's lifetime health outcome back to their genetics. About 60% of someone's lifetime health refers back to their behavior and environment. So choices that are easily modifiable, I don't, uh, so choices, our choices are part of the the behavior and environment, sorry. And only 10% of a person's lifetime health can be attributed back to the healthcare system. That's a stunning statement that only 10% of a person's lifetime health can be attributed to the healthcare system. Yeah, it, it really is. And so, and it, yes, and I am just uh, taking that data straight from a 2007 New England Journal of Medicine paper that goes into all the details of how they did that estimate. But if you think about it, our interactions with the healthcare system as currently constituted are pretty sparse. Um, you know, you said, well, actually, maybe this is our pre-conversation, <laughs> but anyway, it's, um, you know, you don't necessarily go to the doctor all the time. Some people, you know, are good about going in for their yearly checkup. 
I haven't been to a GP, no. a general physician in 17 years, and that was for a checkup. <laughs> I don't know why I That's was That's what there. I was going to allude to, but then I thought, that wasn't on the recording. That was our pre-conversation. Yeah, so. yeah, we, yeah, it was. So <laughs> yeah. we can we can bring it up here. I mean, I, I don't know why you'd go to a doctor. I mean... I'm, I'm See, quite and so that's, confused. that's the issue. So because of that, that I think is a huge driver for why 90% of a person's lifetime health really comes back to their genetics and even more importantly, lifestyle and environment. And then healthcare gets involved at certain really key moments. Um, you know, and it plays a very important role. That 10% is important. Um, clearly, you know, when you have, when you really have a, a, a terrible illness and you're in the healthcare system, uh, but it doesn't drive as much of your lifetime health as these other factors. So we've really wanted to say, well, let's focus on the 90%, understand more about uh, what we can understand molecularly. So genetics plus um, you know, blood measures and things of that nature, coupled with a uh, lifestyle and in- environment. And so that's, uh, that's a really a big element of the uh, goals of scientific wellness. I saw a paper on the, the the title from memory was "Personal choices are the leading cause of death." <laughs> yeah, yeah, personal choices uh, that we make, right? It's yeah, the other it was a it was a valid paper, and it is in the twenty first century. Personal choices are the leading causes of death in the twenty first century. It's not bacteria. It's not viruses. It's um, right, and the greatest predictor of death, of course, is birth. And so we do care about what happens, <laughs> what happens in between, right? Living our, our life, having a full, full, rich life that is uh, enabled by health, and that is uh, allows us to do the things that we, you know, really want to do in in our uh, in our time here. Um, but yeah, so these things have uh, have a big uh, a big uh, a big focus, and so just trying to uh, empower people with knowledge to make simple choices that will help them have a lifetime of health uh, rather th- and avoid unnecessary disease. My grandmother worked in uh, public health uh, and it was quite clear from listening to her and also from what I read that public health uh, was uh, had significant, and I, I can even significant as an understatement, achievements during the 20th century, e.g. against infectious diseases. Uh, so it had huge wins. Going back to her day, people uh, really were a mercy um, of a lot of things, which you no longer are. So I feel quite privileged. But now in the 21st century, we don't worry as much about bacterial and viral infections. And today, it's really uh, lifestyle, which accounts for, say, 80% of disease. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there's been a huge shift from infectious disease as being the dominant killers to chronic disease. And that is right at the heart of this transition between um, the way that we thought about 20th century medicine and the way that we should think um, about 21st century medicine, because it's a very different sense of, set of problems. And if you think about the success we had against infectious disease, it's really stunning. I mean, all of the diseases that were feared you know, by our ancestors, not so distant ancestors, we take it for granted that we're not going to have. Yeah, that. even just a few generations, actually. Just a few generations. My grandma actually suffered from polio, uh, and she had polio, and you know, and that was back in the time. It wasn't, you know, the polio vaccine came out shortly thereafter. You know, if she's born slightly later, she never gets that because the polio vaccine came out, and that was, you know, and would have been um, done away with, and so. When you see, so those uh, successes were uh, dramatic. And so what we think is that 21st century medicine is going to be really driven by more of an approach to the kind of things we're talking about here in scientific wellness and uh, uh, what Lee Hood calls P4 medicine, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And we see that as being the heart of a 21st century medicine that will be tailored to tackle more of this 90% and focused more on uh, the elimination of the uh, chronic diseases, just like we did with the infectious diseases in the last century. Okay, I let, let's just jump on to that and run with it. You mentioned the term scientific wellness. Could you introduce that, Nathan, please? Yeah, so the notion between scientific or quantitative wellness 
is in essence to generate these personal dense dynamic data clouds and use them as a way to quantify uh, the healthy state for an individual and also across a population. So in addition to just sort of that we feel well uh, is a monitoring of uh, different systems in the body to see that they are functioning properly. And then the key to si- and then scientific wellness, um, somewhat paradoxically perhaps, but I hope I can convince our listeners of this, is that scientific wellness is actually the key to understanding disease. Because if you have this quantitative understanding of wellness and these dynamic trajectories, then you can see how individuals start to transition away from wellness. You can see then the earliest transition states to disease. So we start to see the individual path that people take into a disease state. And I think that the signal to noise ratio is going to be much better when we see those individual trajectories than when we look at all late stage disease after many, many things have happened, not only the initial insult, but all of the bodies trying to compensate for it. And so most of our data now is at late stage disease. A focus on scientific wellness will give us a ton of information about all the early transition states. And we think that's going to be really essential. So let me slow that down just a, uh, a touch, yeah. uh, just to make sure everybody uh, listening can follow, follow along. Maybe everybody does, and maybe I'm just uh, over-concerned. But you mentioned the, the, about the signal-to-noise to ratio, and let me clarify. What you're saying is people first have to notice that they are sick, that they have symptoms. Then they go to the doctor, and then they realize, say, they've got stage 4 pancreatic cancer. But by the time you begin taking measurements then, what's definitely very unfortunate for them, and it's unfortunate usually economically too because you have to spend so much on late stage. But what you're saying at the, uh, the data level is the data is quite dirty, maybe because it's became corrupted by the body trying to respond in a defense-type fashion to um, processes that have taken place. Uh, whereas the data would have been much clearer uh, to separate out much earlier in that uh, disease transition. This is what you're saying, right? Yes, that's, that's in essence what I'm saying is that if you have dynamics, what we see is that early on, uh, there's usually a small number <clears throat> of um, perturbations to the system. There's, you know, we track a lot um, these uh values that diverge away from uh, normal. And so early on, you see usually a relatively small number of things that do that. And it tends to get bigger and bigger and bigger as you get closer and closer to diagnosis. Oh, so it becomes harder to sort of decode and decipher the order and the sequence and what's going on because so much is actually now going on. Exactly. And so you just have, so more and more processes have been affected, but at the end then, And we do a lot of these analyses. It's a very conventional thing to do in science. You take omics data, and well, I'll use my I'll use myself as an example. So we have a grant to study Alzheimer's disease, uh, and we study Alzheimer's disease. uh, You know, we study actually the brains of people who have Alzheimer's and those that don't. Uh, But when do we do that? After a person has died, Uh, because you know you can't get a piece of you know no one's giving you a piece of their brain before then, and so you have this. so we get these signals, but they're very late stage, right? We can say, okay, what was different in this Alzheimer's brain from the person that didn't get Alzheimer's? But it's very messy signal at that point um, because, uh, for one, uh, you know, you're getting postmortem tissue. But it, and we, I should clarify, we don't actually get tissue. We just analyze data from people who do this. <laughs> so we don't actually. So nobody's posting you brain slices. No, no, not not me. But we get data from this. Um, but when we look at these data. But there are hundreds of genes that have changed, you know, tons of proteins, micro, anything you look at, there's massive numbers of changes. Um, and some of that is informative, but it doesn't tell us what we really want to know, right? What we really want to know is what was happening in the bodies of these people, you know, 20, 30 years before. Um, and what was happening in the body of the person that went on to get Alzheimer's that wasn't happening in the body of the person that didn't. And what we really, really want to know is if we had seen those early signs for the person who later was going to transition into Alzheimer's, could we have stopped it? Um, you know, and that's what we want to do for many diseases. I'll give you uh, another example, uh, one that's already well worked out. Alzheimer's is a, is a tough um, problem. 
Uh, but let's take diabetes. Diabetes is a very familiar case, and I want to just point to it as, as uh, an example. So we understand pretty well the mechanisms behind diabetes, and we actually have a clinically defined group uh, called prediabetes. And in prediabetes, essentially is monitoring for a, a health in a system. You're looking at your ability to regulate glucose. And if you start to develop insulin resistance, then this is a sign that you might transition to diabetes. Now, if you're pre-diabetic, as I used to be, then you, you know, your insulin resistance, you can watch this tick up. And the intervention for reversing that for type 2 di you know, diabetes, for in uh, pre-diabetes for insulin resistance is pretty simple. You, know, you lower your sugar intake. You know, exercise more, you know, just, you know, monitor a number of different factors and you can back out of it. Pretty simple. Now, if you get to late stage diabetes, you have very serious complications, right? You can lose, uh, anyway, you can read all the horrible symptoms. You can lose a limb, like at the very extreme, like it's, it's horrible. You're right. You've got to end up taking insulin shots all the time and um, more like, uh, and so forth. And so you end up having all of these uh, issues if you let it go to that very late stage. Um, and so I think it's a beautiful example of how if, you note, if you're monitoring for something simple like your uh, insulin resistance and you watch it tick up, you can back out of that disease. No problem if you do it early enough and if you're paying attention to it. Once it gets late, it's hard and it's laden with complications. And so what we want to do is figure out for how many diseases is that true? And we think for the chronic diseases that it will be true for most of them, that there will be a way to define a pre-disease state, probably with ways that we can intervene that are um, you know, relatively uh, simple, re relatively straightforward, relatively safe, and just try to reduce the need to get into that really late stage situation. Well, I, I think type 2 diabetes is a great example and from what i've been uh, looking at most people could spot it coming say a decade away maybe even longer with simple measurements yes and yes so if you look at the cost of diabetes economically and you look at the cost uh, to the individual and uh, collectively i mean to society is massive uh, unnecessary unnecessary suffering taking place and that's what really alarmed me that there is something wrong with healthcare when I realized that millions are walking into diabetes unnecessarily so, and they're very late stage when they're being informed. And then a separate issue, they're getting quite bad information typically uh, on what lifestyle changes to make. And very few doctors are telling their, I want to say patients or clients, I'm not sure which to pick. Patient seems kind of very paternal just for uh, diabetes. Yes. The patient, uh, young, come in young man. The, the, by the time you go to the doctor, it's late stage. And then this information that they, they give, they don't say, hey, you've got life, a choice uh, that you could alter it with lifestyle. And they don't mention the, uh, you can reverse diabetes, whereas yes. I know you can because I've done it and I know other people who've done it. And there is in the past two years, especially with likes of Verta Health coming up, more and more awareness of it that you can reverse. It's not a progressive disease. Yes. And this we could get into all kinds of other issues in terms of you know health and populations because it's you know, behavior change is challenging for people and data alone does not change behavior um, that's been pretty well pretty well established um, uh, it's one of the reasons we work a lot with uh, health coaches to try to uh, you know help uh, individuals achieve a uh, behavior modification from a larger societal point of view it's also true that just the environment and how we construct it makes a huge difference and people who have really studied this you know see this all the time because if you say you know, and in some cases, you know, from a societal level, it's not surprising that we have a diabetes epidemic. We, we create foods that induce diabetes. We market them heavily. We try to make them at, as a society, you know, in 
portions of society work to make them as addictive as possible, et cetera, et cetera. And then we turn around as a society and say, oh, wow, we have a diabetes problem. We need to emphasize more, you know, late stage healthcare, which also costs a fortune. So we have these, you know, these skyrocketing um, healthcare costs, but we feed them as a society, a lot of these problems on the front end. And you could see this, you know, as other societies go through, you know, Westernization and, you know, and, and you know, processed um, uh, foods become more ubiquitous and things like this. You can just watch this. The time series, as I'm sure you've seen on diabetes uh, in our country and worldwide, is staggering. I mean, the level at which that's going up has been um, um, unbelievable. And at some level, you know, people have some you know, understanding of what's happening. I think it's a little different when you make the measurements in your own body. It certainly made a difference for me when I just watched it tick up over time. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm on a, I am on a path I don't want to be on. And so I think that is useful, you know, to then tie back. But there's all kinds of other issues, which is maybe beyond what we want to get into today on just these social ramifications and how, you know, how societies really have to think about how you construct an environment uh, in order to have a big impact on, on public health. Yeah, it concerns me greatly uh, how we organize ourselves uh, on a um, societal level. And I, I've got grave concerns there. Uh, and But unfortunately, I, I don't feel I'm in a position to greatly influence that. And uh, so I decided I would more try and aim at the individual level and I uh, hope that the sort of macrocosm would end up uh, <laughs> reflecting the microcosm. Yeah, well, and I think that that makes a big difference. You know, there's been other uh, studies that have looked at, you know, health is, um, you know, contagious, so to speak. You know, in other words, your health is influenced by your friends. That's the average your of your five health. best friends <laughs> type thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you becoming healthy will probably help other people around Let's you. put it so this that's, way. That's There's a lot more people walking to the blood test lab where I live than there used to be. People used to only go in there when they were sick. It's spreading like a, quote, virus. Hey, go in there before you get <laughs> sick and be super happy. It's very yes. cheap where I'm living. And here's how to interpret the data. And here's my spreadsheet. <laughs> when you were talking uh, about environment, you know, food deserts come straight to mind because some parts of the states I've been in, you can walk and you will find nothing healthy. And so the book yes. comes to mind. I don't know if you know it, Hacking the American Mind by Robert Lustig. Uh, I have not read it. Yeah, I'll I'll need to send you a link because you know Robert to check it out. Robert yeah. Lustig has uh, Sugar the Bitter Truth, the um, highly trafficked lecture he gave on on sugar. Yes, yes, and I'm familiar with Robert and what he's doing. Oh uh, yeah, that. this hacking the American mind is 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 on my reading list. So anyway, um, like in terms of doing a quick calculation on on insulin uh, on type two diabetes coming. You can, like the most simple one I can think of is just HOMA, you know, the homeostatic uh, model yep. assessment, HOMA. Yep. All you need is your insulin. That costs me, I don't know, 12 euros. Uh, and your glucose, which is like, well, you can measure for free at home, but if you want to pay two euros or whatever it is. So you're only talking, at least where I'm living, 12 euros. Put into a HOMA calculator and you, you get something somewhat reasonable coming back. It, at least it's better than just measuring your fasting blood glucose. I, I don't find fasting blood glucose a great... Um, I, 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 I just feel very uncomfortable using that uh, only to predict or to get a gauge on insulin resistance. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so you um, you mentioned scientific wellness and we, we, we spoke of that. And then you wanted to somehow, uh, I'll use the word, boot, bootstrap this uh, scientific wellness concept. And you created something, uh, I guess, with Leroy Hood uh, called The 100 Pioneers. Can you tell me about The 100 Pioneers? Yes. Yeah, so we had been talking about you know, some of these ideas conceptually for a while. And we wanted to uh, figure out a way to get traction and really move this ahead. So... We launched uh, early uh, 2014 uh, something called the Pioneer 100 Project. And essentially what we did was just recruit 100, ended up being 108 uh, people, 
uh, mostly from the Seattle region, but some from a few other places as well, uh, into a program where we were going to um, prototype what we thought, what we could learn from generating all these data. And it was a feasibility study, in essence, to see, could we collect all these data? Could we you know, build systems to try to find uh, some insights? And would it be meaningful to people? And that was our real thesis. So because a big uh, leap that we had to make was in scientific wellness, you know, this concept was we thought that the key to generating, you know, these longitudinal, you know, these dense dynamic data clouds for uh, being able to see those early transition states, the really key was, is there enough information in them now so that they are meaningful to people now, you know, that there, so that there's a reason uh, for someone to go through this program that's in the present and not only in the future. And so when we did the Pioneer 100, we got all these individuals together and it was ended up being just a wonderful experience. We did monthly um, events where you know, we'd walk them through and do education. So what is a microbiome? What are these blood measures and so forth? So we thought that was uh, a fun and informational element to it. And then people came through and every three months uh, over a nine month period, uh, they got their uh, blood drawn and we would measure we did whole genome sequencing on everybody, and then at those three time points, we did uh, proteins, uh, uh, proteome out of the blood, metabolome out of the blood, uh, clinical labs, about 150 different clinical labs uh, get out of the blood. We did microbiome from feces, and uh, then we had them wear uh, wearable devices, Fitbits and things like that. And so all that data together uh, was really fascinating. So I think one of my fears back then was, you know, maybe we'll make all these measures. Uh, it's going to be scientifically interesting, uh, but maybe there's really not very much to tell anybody. And I, you know, I, that was, <laughs> that was probably my number one fear when we were first setting up the study is, you know, maybe there won't be, won't be anything uh, to say. And what was kind of su really surprising uh, to me was that in fact, in uh, for every single person that came through, there was something you know, pretty interesting that we could tell them that they weren't aware of from uh, these set of measures. Uh, and for a number of people, it turned out to be uh, hugely impactful in their health. A number of them said this was the best health experience they'd ever had, even though this was not a healthcare study, it's just a research study. Um, but even still, um, you know, working with a coach and there was a physician that, uh, that interfaced with, um, with people uh, as they went through the program, um, you know, had an, had an effect with them. Uh, so there were some interesting things. So one person, just to give an example, had, this was someone who actually had concierge medicine on both coasts by virtue of their job. Um, and he had developed arthritic like symptoms in his knees and ankles. And this was causing him a lot of problems. He couldn't, uh, couldn't hike in the ma uh, mountains with his family anymore, which is something he really loved to do. And so he's having these issues. So he came into our program. And we did this 360 degree view, all these data and uh, something pretty simple uh, jumped out, which was that the ferritin levels or the iron essentially in his blood was really high. And we looked in his genome and he had uh, uh, the genes that gave the highest risk for a disease known as hemochromatosis. Uh, and so we gave that information uh, back to him, uh, to his physician, uh, back in the healthcare system. And he got diagnosed, in fact, with hemochromatosis. And what's, what's fascinating is that hemochromatosis is, its main line uh, can lead to liver dysfunction and ultimately death. You can, you can die from hemochromatosis. But one of the lesser known side effects is that that iron can actually catalyze cartilage breakdown in some people. And so, uh, and so in his case, basically, he went he got treated for hemochromatosis. And if, uh, you know, if our listeners aren't aware of this, this treatment for hemochromatosis is dead simple. Donate blood once a month, right? Physicians have a fancy name for it, right? Therapeutic phlebotomy, like in everything in medicine. But basically, you get blood once a month. Get rid of that. You get Getting rid of the blood gets rid of the excess iron, uh, brought his levels back to normal, and uh, the cartilage issues in his knees and ankles um, subsided. Uh, and he was able to get back to um, hiking with his family. And so we thought that was uh, really meaningful. And uh, again, it's a very simple example of because he was empowered with knowledge, he can make a very simple choice, in this case, donating blood, and eliminate a, a, a disease. He was one of the two. We had a second person 
who also had the genes that gave the highest risk for hemochromatosis. And she is a woman, she's pre-menopause. So for obvious reasons, she would not have manifested this, but tells her that, okay, no, you know, no need to be alarmed. You've got these genes. It gives you a high risk for hemochromatosis. Just monitor your ferritin levels. If they ever go up, donate blood. So she's empowered with knowledge to eliminate a disease trajectory from her future, right? Completely doesn't have to exist for her. If she doesn't know it and she's just kind of going along in her life, there's a good chance she will develop hemochromatosis. But with the knowledge and the very simple decisions, she can eliminate that disease trajectory completely from her future. And so that's what that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Ferritin, I measure periodically, and it's only five euro sixty. I mention prices only because it's kind of so insane if, if you can get access at such cost not to check such things. Or, for example, I check GGT, which I, I find a a great marker. So you, this is the you're speaking of two people out of what was called the Pioneer One Hundred study, right? Yes. And when was that study done? So that study was done in tw- uh, 2014. Uh, so it ran from April, I think it was April through December of that year uh, when people were actually going through. And then, of course, we did a lot of data analysis subsequent to that. But that was that was, uh, was the genesis of that. And then you've also got something called the 100 K, 100,000 Wellness Project. And how does 100,000 Wellness Project fit in? Did that come afterwards? It's obviously uh, vastly more people. Have you had 100,000 people? Has it completed? What is this 100K wellness project? Where does it fit in? How did it come about? What's the mission? Where is it? So we announced the 100K wellness project as basically an aspirational project. We actually announced that in 2013. So the 100 Pioneer was was meant to be essentially a pilot uh, because we said, all right, you know, we thought... At a, you know, at an approximation that if we had 100,000 individuals that we could learn uh, a huge amount about transition states to all the major human diseases at that sort of scale. And so uh, that was sort of the aspiration that we uh, set out to do. And so, uh, so that vision actually came first. And then we did the Pioneer 100, which was uh, a size that was feasible for us to take on. Uh, so far, we have about 5,000 uh, people who have come through uh, this program that we have uh, Dense Dynamic Data Clouds on. Uh, that's through our partnership with Aravel, with the spin-out company. Um, but basically, we have that. And we're building out things that are related to this, uh, uh, this project in different ways. We've also affiliated with Providence St. Joseph Health, uh, which is a uh, 50 hospital system in the western united states lee hood has become their chief science officer now and basically uh there we're generating dense dynamic data clouds in a number of different populations um a thousand people in uh, providence uh have uh signed up to go through a scientific wellness program and then we also are doing dense dynamic data clouds for certain uh, populations relevant to different diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis, and so um, and breast cancer and, and a number of others. And so, what we're doing is populating out towards that hundred thousand with a combination of uh, people who are going through a wellness program, as well as people who are uh, in different uh, disease categories. So that we are uh, filling that out in, in various ways. Uh, we're also partnering uh, with a group out in China. Uh, Lee Hood's going to co-chair uh, the what's being called the International Human Phenomics Organization. Uh, we were all just in China uh, last month. Uh, and China, it turns out, has really gotten invested in this whole vision. Uh, and in fact, China has is investing $3 billion into a project very much a very much a version of what we had announced as you know, our version of the, of the 100K Wellness Project. Uh, and so that will be part of this international human phenomics organization. And so, so there are, um, you know, there's increasing uh, interest in this and the hundred K was, is kind of the encompassing vision of, of where, where we're going in terms of recruiting, uh, individuals into, uh, well, in terms of generating data clouds that we think are necessary for, uh, understanding those disease transitions. I can't help, but be shocked and think that 
why is the state not doing this? I mean, it would seem very pertinent upon the state as a civic duty and a collective duty to be doing this, not a private enterprise. Yeah, I we really thought that as well. So we tried, of course, to get, uh, to get the government interested in funding this project at the beginning. And we're not uh, successful at doing that here. It's sort of interesting, right? The Chinese government is massively interested in this. And, you know, like I said, they just committed $3 billion, a pretty stunning um, uh, amount. But actually, I think perfectly in line because this kind of, you know, you're, you're talking about something, you know, that investment is roughly on the scale of what the U.S. put into the Human Genome Project. And, you know, this feels like, um, you know, an equally important uh, probably much more health impactful. Well, I know the genome is hugely impactful in the long run, uh, but this is this would accelerate that uh, to a huge degree. There is sort of a version of this in the U.S. Of course, there's the All of Us program. Although the All of Us program is very genomics focused, it's it's very centered on trying to have a million people. I hope that project is successful. I you know I'm rooting for it, but it's. Uh, but it feels like I think they could have gotten a lot farther if they had done a smaller number of people with deep phenotyping as opposed to sort of limited phenotyping over so many, many people. Yeah, I saw the NIH project. It was an NIH project at all of us. And it seemed it, it seemed NIH, to have the right philosophy project, yeah. uh, behind it, the, the philosophy we've spoken of. But it just felt a little, for want of a better way, putting a, a touch late a touch late to the game, like running behind the ball type thing. Yeah, well, there were certainly other efforts, um, you know, that were earlier. Um, you know, we had actually, we had tried to pitch ours to them, I don't know, a year, year, year and a half or so before the All of Us program. I forget what it was exactly. It's, I think it's a, it's a noble endeavor. I'm, you know, uh, endeavor. I'm, you know, I'm excited about that. I just think, from my standpoint, though, I think they focus, they uh, fixated too much. I don't know, maybe it was for political reasons. I don't know. But I feel like they fixated too much on wanting to have a million people. Because I think as soon as you commit to a million, you're, you know, you divide the resources that you've got to a million people. And pretty soon, you know, you're doing genomics. But genomics on a million people is already very expensive, uh, even at, you know, current prices. Though it's getting, of course, better and better. Um and then you have some limited clinical data. I actually feel like a lot of the field as a whole uh, really is missing the boat right now uh, to some degree in the sense that I feel like there's so much interest in genomics plus, um, you know, clinical outcomes and, and phenotypes. And I love that work. We use, you know, we use outcome from that all the time. But as you add to that, you're essentially getting variants that have smaller and smaller effect sizes and you're increasing your statistical power to see them. And while I think that's useful, I think for the same investment, taking those genomics and putting them in the context of these personal dense dynamic data clouds with deep phenotyping, I just think you can learn so much more. In fact, we had a very interesting interaction recently, you know, so we have these 5,000 data clouds and, you know, and someone asked, well, you know, from this genomics world, and they said, well, how many more do you need so you can start deriving insights? You know, we just kind of looked at them you know, sort of dumbfounded because you're like, um, well, yeah, we could derive, I'm like, we could take this current data that we have and derive insights from it for 20 years without any problem. Like there's so many questions we can ask and answer. And it's, you know, the data clouds are enormously rich. You can analyze these kind of data sets for a long time. So it's a very different paradigm than this notion of, you know, pushing out genomics, which is, you know, at a first approximation, sort of one kind of analysis, there's of course variants to that, but you know, it's kind of one kind of analysis trying to figure out what are, um, you know, what are these increasing, these small variants to get uh, effect sizes to get uh, to clinical significance. Now, there is some transitions, of course, because as you have enough, you can start thinking about network effects and combinations and, and things like that. Although combinations need to be, uh, refined in that space to keep your combinatorics down because brute force combinatorics and genomics is impossible. Even if we had, you know, you know, every person on the planet sequenced, you know, those combinatorics get really big, really fast. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get it suck too much more into this aside, but it's, but just the notion is from smaller numbers of these dense dynamic data clouds, you can learn qualitatively different things and, and, and a massive amount 
that you just never get from genomics plus clinic. The, 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 the data clouds fill in all the intermediate information that we think is going to be actionable. You know, we call this the manifestation of genetic risk in the body. So you can take variants that we already have. You can get all the molecular correlates in the data clouds, and then it starts telling you what is different about people who are at high and low risk for all these different diseases, and it gives you clues into paths towards prevention. And that's we're mining that like crazy right now. I think that's going to be really interesting. On, I appreciate that. On the on the on other people doing it front, leaving the state aside, it sounds very much also like Project Baseline uh, from Google's Verily. Would you Would you agree? Yes, um, you know, to the extent that that's, they don't speak about it publicly terribly much, but it's, uh, but yeah, it's it's certainly um, similar to that. Um, well, I remember actually in the early days after we had launched our effort, and then there was a press release uh, from, uh, you know, from Project Baseline, and um, and I remember a lot of people came to us and they, you know, it was almost like, oh, are you guys going to quit now? Google's going to do everything. <laughs> yeah, go home. Which, uh, I'm very happy we did do. Yeah, go home. They're like, oh, Google has so much more money than you. Like, there's no point to do what you're doing. It was kind of this, it was this kind of odd reaction from people around yeah, give us. Give up your um, day job, Nathan. And yeah, exactly. And so now, so we kept uh, plugging along, thankfully. Uh, but Project Baseline, in the extent that they're trying to quantify, you know, these uh, 10,000 people, I think they said. And, um, you know, establish baselines for it. Like, I love all that uh, in the sense that it's very aligned with where where we're going and the kind of thing that we think should happen in the future of medicine. And, you know, our efforts, you know, as much effort as we put into this, if you compare it to the size of healthcare, you know, are still, you know, pinprick small. And so, you know, so I'm very happy to see, you know, our efforts move forward. I want to see a project baseline move forward. Uh, you mentioned China's iCarbonX, which is very similar to what, what we're talking about. I mentioned it to you by email. Oh, you haven't mentioned it yet. Yeah, sorry about that. I've been tracking iCarbonX for a long time. That's a, I, I, iCarbonX and what I saw would seem more of a clone of the Human Longevity uh, Incorporated. Yep, there's human longevity, Craig Venter's effort. Uh, there's what Mike Snyder's doing down at Stanford. Uh, you know, I'm, in general, just a big fan of all these efforts because I want to see healthcare move in a way that embraces wellness more deeply. I want to see us as, you know, as humanity, you know, really generate as many of these personal dense dynamic data clouds as we need to understand how to predict and prevent disease. And I want to cross that bridge. And so, you know, I don't want, you know, there's no sense that I would be very sad if we were the only effort. It would mean that, you know, no one else is buying into this this vision at all. And I think there's lots of different places that are buying into, you know, you know their own variants of, of, of this vision. And, uh, and we want to see that become the future of healthcare. And so we need, you know, more and more people uh, to push that. So I'm, you know, excited about all those, all those kind of efforts now. Yeah. You might find it China leapfrogs the U.S. on the healthcare front. I think there is some uh, reasons to believe that um, the U.S. remains, you know, very, you know, very strong and a, a very strong center of research innovation. So we, we've got a lot of of that. Uh, but in terms of this embracing of um, certainly some of these concepts that we've talked about with scientific wellness, uh, deep phenotyping, and so forth, uh, China seems to embrace it more so than the U.S. Uh, we do have a lot of these private um, uh, enterprises, as we've talked about you know, here in the U.S. as well as in China. Publicly, uh, China has embraced it more, I would say. I think this $3 billion human uh, phenome project is uh, going to be a huge leap in that direction. Um, you know, the All of Us program, you know, I would like to see move more towards deep phenotyping. You know, and they say that they want to do that. It's, it's a part of their cohort. Um, I'd love to see that accelerated. But it's, um, but I think China is moving aggressively. It, when we were in Shanghai this last uh, 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 month, yeah, it's uh, it's very impressive. We you know we went through one of the most impressive hospitals I've ever seen uh, in Jiahui. We went uh, through a um, you know they've got uh, you know this phenome project, which was kind of overwhelmingly impressive, uh, at least in the scale of the ambitions of it to start with. 
And so, yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a lot, uh, that they're pushing forward there. You know, the number of patients they have to deal with is incredible. Uh, but there's also a lot of asymmetry still in China, you know, in terms of the big cities, I think are really rolling forward really fast and they've got a lot of uh, the rest of the population that they need to, uh, worry about as well. With the 2025 vision, uh, China's 2025 vision, they're definitely aiming to, uh, to, to race ahead. And for example, on the iCarbonX front, uh, Tencent, they invested $155 million on, on their on a Series A round into iCarbonX. iCarbonX has raised a huge amount of money, yeah. And China um, also doesn't have the same uh, privacy core issues around genomic data, etc. That's right. So there are certain reasons why Chinese companies will be you know, actually, I think less burdened by, um, you know, regulations than in the United States. Um, you know, and people can argue, you know, positive, negative of that. But, but yeah, I think that's, it's a real difference. Yeah. But if you just look at independently, like as a race into the future, one is encumbered, uh, is encumbered with privacy uh, regulation. The other thing is uh, America is getting increasingly uncompetitive because employers are paying so much for healthcare, their employees are getting sicker and sicker, and healthcare costs are going more and more up. And employees are not seeing that because it's coming out their paycheck. You know, it's coming prior to their paycheck, right. but they're not so aware that hey, this is what's making China cheaper. That the workforce is not as sick. Yeah, it's it's a huge issue, and it gets us back to you know the uh, you know some of the societal issues, which is. You know, we we need to embrace um, you know a culture of wellness much more so uh, than we have, and it's and typical lifestyle and culture really drives a lot of health. And there has already started to be you know revolutions in in this way, um, you know, of communities that are becoming um, healthier. And can you name one? Well, I think the well, I would say pretty broadly the West Coast. It's a, it's a big ship to turn. Uh, and I think food companies are actually coming around on this somewhat too. I think they're you know, worried about, uh, you know, as people learn about all the you know, negative uh, health impacts of you know, packing sugar into, you know, so many things. You know, my, you know, I think there's some worry that that would ultimately be viewed sort of like uh, cigarettes back in the day, you know, and, and you know. I think the did. processed food industry will be seen as a uh, big tobacco and definitely large food manufacturers are certainly looking at reformulating their formulas and strategies and embracing the, or trying to embrace this zeitgeist. Yeah, and a lot of them... Because, you know... They, yeah, a lot of them will talk about this, right? And so they, they understand that a lot of their consumers are turning much more towards health and they want, you know, they want food that reflects that better. Anyway, two important questions I've got for you. Let me uh, fire uh, two of them at you. My second guest, Joseph Antoon, he was pushing the the biggest cause of disease is aging. Aging is the disease, if we can uh, call it that. And if you can solve aging or let us age more gracefully, then you don't need to worry about downstream diseases. But when you talk, you always, from what I've heard so far, speak of just diseases and catching specific diseases and knowing the disease states ahead of time before people manif are manifesting symptoms but i'm i'm wondering why are you not mentioning aging yeah that's uh, certainly an oversight on my part and it's um so we're very interested in aging we actually have a paper on aging that we're going to be submitting here within two weeks so we've been working on it uh and we've mapped out across all the data clouds uh you know all the elements that we see for um healthy aging uh, so we have developed a, um, a biological age calculation from the multiomic data, uh, which we'll release here shortly. Uh, and we've delved in to see, you know, kind of across this broad wealth of data, what is different for people as they age uh, related to a number of different health metrics. So we are actually very interested in aging. And I did speak a lot about disease. Uh, I guess I got into that track. But in essence, but I actually don't want to end there. We end up talking a lot about disease because in the science world, we have a vast amount of information and data 
about disease for the reasons I mentioned at the beginning. There hasn't been a big focus on studying wellness quantitatively and so forth. What I really want to get to is more deeply understanding health and healthy aging is a huge part of that. And so one of the things, for example, uh, and uh, the human genome, I feel like it's been very missold to the public in some ways uh, because of this focus in the research world uh, that you were just pushing you know, or just alluding to. Because I think that the general person on the street, when they hear the genome, I feel like there's this mental issue that it's like a crystal ball that's going to tell you how you're going to die. Right? Everyone's like, oh, don't get your genome sequence. It scares you. Yeah, so you might as well not change your lifestyle and habits. You know, it's predetermined at birth where the stars were type. Yeah, thing. and don't find out anything about your genome because all it's going to do is scare you and tell you, you know, all the different ways you're going to die. It's like a tarot reading. Yeah, and I think that, and I think that's just a very wrong perception because your genome isn't about your death. Your genome is about life, you know, life processes. A good example of this is uh, there's a tribe of Native Americans uh, here in, you know, just outside the, the Seattle region, and they were the subject of a, uh, of a paper. And anyway, so, you know, and it's brought up all the time that, you know, so this population has diabetes genes, right? High risk for diabetes. Well, in fact, those genes are not diabetes genes. Those genes are genes that were well adapted to the lifestyle that they lived, you know, on, you know, out here, uh, you know, throughout, you know, the course of their history. And so the notion there is that those are genes that are adapted well to a certain environment, i.e. it's about the life process. And they only become, quote unquote, diabetes genes when you can, when you cross them with a Western diet, they are not, those genes are particularly maladapted to a Western diet uh, scenario. And so the whole notion is, so we talk a lot about, you know, trying to understand the manifestation of genetic risk in the body and studying disease. We do that because that's the wealth of data that's available today. But in the long run, I actually don't think that the study of what we're talking about should be so driven to disease. And it actually is a very key concept that we talked about for scientific wellness, which is to try to quantify wellness that incorporates uh, the notion of aging, should make that more explicit. Um, and so, and from that standpoint, you're looking at these disease transitions. But at the end of the day, I actually do believe in, you know, if you go think about this to a farther future, that we might not even deal so much with uh, the concept of disease the way that we do now. Now, in the short run, we absolutely have to because that's, that's where we're at. But in the long run, I think if you really understand that wellness state and you're just trying to correct deviations from it, that that whole science should be much more focused on, you know, how well are all your body's, you know, systems really operating and trying to uh, hone them and correct them. And that if you're doing that, uh, in the long run, right, as we think into the far future, maybe that gets us into a place where we're actually not all that focused on disease at all, you know, but that's, um, that's not immediate future, but that's, that's where I think this ultimately could go. Yeah. So thank you for that question. I appreciate that because I, I can get talking about avoiding disease more than I want to in terms of the, uh, the really where I think this should ultimately go. Yeah, and on, uh, it reminds me that on uh, Institute of Functional Medicine uh, slide pack that you delivered, you put uh, that you're aiming uh, to help a democratization of healthcare. As a, it was a bullet point. Can you ex explain what you were meaning by democrati democratization of healthcare? Sure. So one of the things that we want to be very mindful of is, you know, we don't want... Um, kind of this personalized or precision medicine approach to be just for the rich. Um, there are certain elements uh, that are like that in early adopters and so forth, you know, people that will spend disposable income on these things. Uh, and that's probably inevitable. But ultimately, what you want is to be able to derive insights that benefit everyone. So, uh, so there's a number of different ways that that can play out. So one is uh, trying to uh, push, and this is already happening, you know, that the various assays and so forth get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, second, we think that a focus ultimately on a wellness-centric healthcare could be done in a way that would dramatically reduce healthcare costs 
uh, from all the spending on late stage disease. You are working alongside Leroy Hood. Now, Leroy, uh, or Lee, as you, you shorten it to. Yeah, Lee, Lee greatly prefers Lee. <laughs> he invented the automatic. Oh, does he? Yes. I don't know. I've never yes. spoken with him. <laughs> okay, I'll note, I'll note for the future. He invented the automatic DNA sequencer. Uh, I, and, you know, the human genome project wouldn't have been possible without that. And it was h- h- him. I believe, who came up with the term scientific wellness? Uh, correct? Yeah, certainly came out of it. Do I attribute that to Lee Hood alone? Um, yeah, Lee or Lee and me. I mean, basically, yeah, it was our efforts. But... Oh, Lee and me. Okay, I'm unsure. We'll, we'll, we'll give Jewel credit. But, Lee, but, Lee, is, but uh, Lee, Lee is the face of this thing, yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll, put, we'll put him as lead author. How's that? Absolutely. <laughs> we'll put you as co-author. Well, he said that the scientific wellness industry will be worth more by market capitalization than today's disease care industry. So in other words, orthodox healthcare is only a sick care industry. It's focused on sick, which is all good, but that's where the focus is, is on disease. Once you get sick, that's where it puts its uh, focus and say 90%, 97% of its money. And he, so, as I was saying, he he said that the scientific wellness will be worth more by market cap than today's orthodox uh, healthcare industry. Uh, do you share that point of view? Yes, I, I do actually share that point of view. Um, I think it might take a little longer than Lee thinks, but it's probably already made quite a bit of discussion. But uh, but directionally, we're both big believers that uh, scientific wellness uh, will be uh, the dominant. Um, paradigm for 21st century medicine. I think there's a question of how long that will take. The, the current healthcare industry has huge inertia to it, obviously. Uh, and there, and for all of our talk about trying to get to something that's not driven by just, you know, disease, you know, this heavy disease focus, the fact of the matter is in our current healthcare system, that's the massive focus. Uh, and so for chronic disease in the 21st century, Yes, we believe that um, it needs to become more wellness-centric for the reasons we talked about at the beginning. So this shift from infectious disease to chronic disease, uh, the desire to move upstream, and the data clouds that we and others are generating are going to be the substrates for letting that happen. Uh, And so, so ultimately, yeah, we very much believe that 21st century medicine will be about the evolution from this late stage disease care more and more towards earlier wellness care, and then ultimately more healthcare resources will go into that, uh, into that, um, and become bigger over time. And so, directionally, yeah, we're very aligned that that's uh, that's where we think the future is headed. I notice we're running out of time here. Let me try and cut it down to I hope two questions. Today, I with today's healthcare, I I had heard that the hospital charges $20,000 per hour for chopping the feet off diabetics. And the hospital only gets $200 per hour for giving lifestyle advice. So it's very hard to see how the incentives can can move within that system so as to prevent. What do you think? Yeah, this is a, this is a huge issue. And it gets really to the heart of the heart of the matter because – you know, we have to make just being realistic in terms of what you know is going to happen in the world. We have to get economic incentives uh, aligned, and it is as you get into the space, as I'm sure you found, it's sort of alarming to the degree to which economic and health incentives are not always aligned. So there is some push on this. There's of course the movement towards value based um, um, payments, uh, and so that is one step that I think can be beneficial. It has its own uh, complexities, but that uh, is at least a start. And the flip side is that there are going to be uh, disruptive forces, I believe, in medicine, and you're going to start to have uh, systems that are embracing uh, this new new view of 21st century medicine. And ultimately, uh, I think they are going to be, we have to let the marketplace become competitive and uh, so that those places can, uh, you know, alternate views can move forward and we start having, uh, you know, competition and innovation in the marketplace. Um, 
in healthcare, you know, for, for obvious reasons, because there's you know, such important safety concerns, uh, but it's a very highly regulated space. And, uh, and while a lot of that is, is very necessary, very good, uh, there is going to have to be a period, I think, of um, there's going to be transformations that will become very apparent that are, that are highly needed. And we have to uh, make sure that you know, regulations that are in place for safety are held, but those that are just sort of there um, to protect the status quo or to, or to disincentivize innovation you know, from heavy lobbying and things like that, maybe some of those need to be uh, loosened. And so I think, and we're already starting to see some innovation, actually, that I think is very good. One innovation, this isn't directly related to this, but I'll just point this out, is with um, Scott uh, uh, Gottlieb, who, the uh, chairman of the uh, FDA, has, has made, a, I think, a very important move in the genomics space. So for a long time, genomics was being evaluated sort of the same way that we've done things in the past. But what it was is that every single time you found a variant or, you know, or a combination or you know, some polygenic score or whatever it is, and you wanted to say, you know, be able to tell someone about it, that you had to go through a, its own independent regulatory process. And it'd take a couple of years. You know, so you know, 23andMe had to go through this. They got one down. My favorite tweet from that was, you know, they're like one down, two million, uh, two million nine hundred nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine to go. You know? yeah. It's like okay, we're not even going to be able to work through these, you know, through the you know, ever. You know, I'll die out before we're That's done. Pretty funny, yeah. Which is a pretty funny one. But what they've done at the FDA now, which I just love, is they said, okay, we have an important issue, which is the safety of people and the validity of genetic information that goes to them. Hundred percent. That's important. But then they said, okay. But maybe we can solve that without this kind of ludicrously slow process, which is that now they're piloting a set of companies and the companies come through and then they get vetted on their process, what evidence they use and, uh, uh, you know, what, how they're presenting it and so forth. But they can do that as a program, as a package. And see, I love that because then what that does is that says, okay, we're not going to put regulations in place that are irrational, that are blocking like the entire future of that field and all the good it can do. But instead, we are, but we are going to safeguard against charlatans. We're going to safeguard against people that don't know what they're doing by having regulations in place that review the processes of how it's going, how they evaluate evidence. And then you have, and then those are subject to periodic review. So I love that. So that's the kind of that's the kind of innovation that I think we need on the regulatory side, is where we we look at the fundamental safety issue that has to be preserved that we have to maintain, which is vital. But then ask the question: Can we set things up in a way that that achieves that, but also allows there to be innovation and progress? And so I thought that was a beautiful example of that. And I think that's what's going to have to happen uh, in the uh, the wellness. Uh, you know, centric healthcare space as well, which is, um, you know, to try to think about creative ways to get those economic and health uh, incentives aligned, because that's what's really going to drive the good for the most people. Nathan, uh, trying to wrap this up here, you had said at my um, event again, uh, I'm trying to remember uh, what the quote was, in fact, it was, you said, here it is, I found it. Humanity is about to cross from ignorance into knowledge on many, many fronts because we've never actually measured our bodies as an integrated system in much detail before. So picking up on that, I, I find it absolutely crazy that we've not been measuring our bodies and taking lots of data, data being blood samples, data being genomics, data being uh, stool tests, Etc. and measuring people over time who are not sick. And so my parents both, uh, deep breath, unfortunately uh, died of cancer. And I lament greatly that they were not measured uh, from a healthy state, and yes, into cancer and towards death, because that would have at least allowed them to contribute something back to humanity in a way they died in vain in that regard. And I, 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 I greatly l lament that they were not measured from health to disease to progression through disease because data 
is a key to to deciphering that. Instead, we're just had you know basic measurements once sick, and hey, here's your dose of chemo. So, uh, do you agree with that? Uh, I very much agree with that, um, and it's it's an issue. Because what we really want to know, of course, is can we can we intervene? Can we stop these things? And especially now, where we can couple, and we're actually we have a proposal in on this right now. We'll see if it gets funded. Uh, working with uh, Jim Heath uh, here at the Institute for Systems Biology, but basically trying to couple these sorts of data clouds enriched with a bunch more uh, immune specific information, and coupling that to immune therapies. Because what you should be able to do is a pretty comprehensive monitoring. Um, and uh, in this case, we're focusing it on recurrence to be, uh, so we have a, a focused population. But you should be able to take these things like the data clouds, watch the trajectories, design an immunotherapy. And in this kind of way, you could eliminate a lot of cancers if something like this works. And so I think that we want to do that. Another thing we're doing, and this is joint with Tom Brown, uh, who's the head of the Swedish Cancer Institute here in Seattle, uh, is we've also launched a breast cancer uh, survivorship program. And we're doing exactly this. We're taking people who have uh, gotten a breast cancer diagnosis, and we are monitoring them with this kind of dense dynamic data clouds from the point of diagnosis through their chemotherapy. And then what we're trying to do is even when people survive the cancer, and very thankfully survive, because chemotherapy hits so much of your body, just kind of decimates different elements of your body, it takes a long time to get back to health. And so we're actually monitoring this entire process to try to figure out ways that we can enhance uh, the return to wellness, the return to health for, uh, in this case, women who are uh, coming through breast cancer. You know, and I've, you know, I've, we've had you know, breast cancer in my family, and it's, uh, you know, it's a big, you know, it's a big personal issue, and it's a big issue for many of us, and it is uh, something where we think, yeah, mapping that. So we're, we're going to be looking at early stage. We have a number of examples of people who come to the program where we can see you know, potential early warning signs for cancers. We're trying to work those out. Uh, we want to understand what's happening during the course of therapy, and we want to see what's happening for the return to wellness because we're having more and more cancer survivors, thankfully. And so that's, yeah, we're very interested in that, that whole uh, process. And at the very least, as you say, as you go through this, you know, we can really learn from it. And so hopefully, you know, we can make, I think, these kind of approaches you know, from humans with dense dynamic data clouds, we're going to be able to work out just a ton related to both health and disease. And I think it's going to be really, um, really meaningful in the long run. I see we're over our allotted time. Yes. <laughs> let me just, just let, let me make it one last simple question, Nathan, right? I'll, I'll save the simple, simple one for last. I think that we're going to end up with two industries. We're going to have the orthodox healthcare of today. It is likely to stay focused on acute care and, uh, you know, the traditional stuff, the um, vaccines, etc. Uh, injuries. But we'll have a new separate um, industry in adjacent in addition, which will be far more built upon engineering data science uh, principles, which will focus on prediction, prevention, and optimization. Uh, I, I, I don't see the current orthodox healthcare transitioning over there, although there will be overlap yet to be determined. So do you, do you, have, do you, um, do you foresee something similar, or do you think the orthodox healthcare will somehow transition and uh, because for me, orthodox healthcare is built upon a principle that there will be people involved. It's very person centric, you know, healthcare professionals, doctors. It's not very uh, machine and device uh, centric. It keeps people in the middle, and that is just not where <laughs> it's not where the future is going. It's very device and software centric, and software and devices uh, scale. And for example, when you talk about people and the biology and uh, looking at all their systems, I am 100% sure we're going to be running uh, by a, a people's biology in the cloud, as in running avatar, biological avatars of them in the cloud. 
and they'll resync with that once a year. You know, it's predicting what's going to take place with that person over the next six months or the next 12 months. And you do the odd test and it resyncs again. So the question is, do you f- believe there'll be two industries yourself? Where, where do you stand in that position? Hmm, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think there's a lot still up in the air. I do think that a lot of the innovation will have to come from outside the current healthcare industry. I think most huge innovations virtually always happen that way. Uh, it will be very interesting to see if uh, healthcare systems can be, if they can adopt and change uh, sufficiently to be the beneficiaries of that revolution. Um, and I do have some hopes on that. I mean, you know, if I look at the Providence St. Joseph Health System, you know, they brought in uh, Lee Hood and ISB. You know, scientific wellness is a part of their, uh, you know, of their um, five-year, you know, strategic plan and wanting to disrupt themselves. And so I see, you know, I, uh, Ron Hockman, who's been, I think, really a visionary leader there. Uh, you know, there's a number of, you know, so I think there's some signs that, that, you know, at least certain healthcare systems are open to this. I think there is really a question of, you know, just given the, the scale and scope of all that they're doing and, you know, just how much that can be absorbed. But I do absolutely think that there will be a remaking of a, a, a very different uh, kind of approach on healthcare and that that will, in essence, arise mostly from outside the healthcare system. But it's, it'll be a question of how much partnership, how much deep integration there is with, with the current healthcare system. And I think that's really in part up to the leadership of current healthcare systems. But it's an extremely hard challenge because almost always big innovations come from, you know, small you know, new, you know, new startup <laughs> endeavors that grow as opposed to, you know, radical shifts of big organizations. And I think that's probably going to be true in health. Um, I'm apologetic. We're over the, the time with you, but I highly appreciate you sparing your time graciously uh, with us today. Well, it's great to be with you, Larry. Uh, appreciate it. It's great to talk to you. And I hope to catch up and hopefully we'll get an update of this 100K wellness project. Sounds good. We'll talk soon. Thank you very much, Nathan. For more information, please see hyperwellbeing.com or follow Twitter at hyperwellbeing.